Hi everyone, I'm Mandy Wimmer and welcome to another episode of Legends Light. We've got some interesting things on this episode. We're diving into one of the most cold-blooded attempted murders ever recorded in the Black Hills. And something Deadwood is very well known for, ghost stories. I talked to Ty Sanford, Maurice Miller, and Chris Carpenter about some haunting experiences in this famous mining town. Ty is a Deadwood Alive reenactor, and he knows a ton about Deadwood history. Mo and Chris are paranormal investigators who were in Deadwood investigating the activity at the Bullock Hotel. And to totally freak me out, we did these interviews in Seth's cellar at the Bullock Hotel where some of this paranormal activity actually took place. We're going to start off with Ty Sanford. But before we get to that interview, here's a quick message from our friends in Deadwood. Explore the Adams Museum, the Days of 76 Museum, the Adams House, and Mount Moriah Cemetery to fully understand Deadwood's raucous past. At the Adams Museum, get up close and personal with the legends and outlaws who brought Deadwood international notoriety and see Deadwood's own one-of-a-kind Wild Bill Hickok collection. Visitors to the Days of 76 Museum become acquainted with an astonishing collection of wagons and carriages, including the infamous Deadwood Stage, along with an extensive collection of historic firearms and Indian artifacts. The Adams House, built in 1892, is an elegant Victorian-era home with original contents that chronicles Deadwood's transition from a lawless mining camp to a prosperous and technologically rich metropolitan city. And finally, Deadwood's Boot Hill, Mount Moriah Cemetery, provides a tranquil location to pay homage and respect to such notables as Wild Bill Hickok, Calamity Jane, and Seth Bullock. Let your journey through the Wild West begin in historic Deadwood, South Dakota. All right, everyone, welcome to episode two of Legends Light. I am sitting here with Deadwood Alive reenactor and our trusted Deadwood history guy, Ty Sanford. Ty, welcome to Legends Light. Oh, it's glad to be back here working with you guys. Well, it's, it's good to be back in Deadwood. We, we <laughs> love it here. So we're going to start off today by talking about probably one of the most cold-blooded attempt at murder in the city of Deadwood that's been recorded in the Black Hills. And then we're gonna move to everybody's favorite ghost stories. So, and the cool thing about this attempted murder is that nobody's really gonna know this person's name, but it's it's actually the craziest story I think I've ever heard. (laughs) So we're just just gonna jump, we're just gonna jump right in. It certainly caught me off guard when I was looking for it. And like I said, nobody, if, if someone has heard of this name, I will be both very surprised and very impressed, and I'll finally have somebody to talk to about the case. Uh, <laughs> when you sent me the articles about this, I was just completely baffled. The fact that I don't, nobody knows this person. Yeah, nobody knows them. But this is the craziest story I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. So, okay, like I said, let's just get started. So, take me back to Deadwood 1880s. The person that was a, attempted to be murdered was Charles Posner, and he was a fruit dealer. And mm-hmm. his um, would-be assassin was Moses Dietendorf. Dittendorf, we're not really sure. There's no yeah. one here to correct us, so we'll just go with whichever <laughs> version we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what was the relationship between these two men? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but the paper starts out saying that Moses was a brother-in-law to him. A brother-in-law? Which makes the crime, I think, even more heinous that <laughs> you well, ma- marry into yeah. this family and the brother-in-law is <laughs> trying to kill you. And- <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have married that sister. Wow, that's amazing. Um, that's amazing. So then, so potentially relatives. I also read that maybe he was also in the same industry. Maybe there was a dispute over the fruit situation or... Yeah. Or, okay. From what I've gathered, part of the agreement... So uh, we'll just, yeah, like you said, start at the beginning. Uh, I, not much is known about Charles Posner before the 1880 yeah, census. Right, right. It shows him in Deadwood working as a laborer. Right. Uh, sometime between then and September of 1881, he got his start as a fruit merchant and a fruit distributor got here it. in Deadwood. Okay. Uh, apples, oranges, bananas, all these exotic fruits that you can get in Deadwood right. in, in 1881. Uh, by this point, he must have had himself established enough, had enough money to send for his family back east. So Moses Dittenhofer, his brother-in-law, sees his family safe passage from New York City, I'm assuming, uh, to uh, Deadwood. Oh, interesting. And as a thank you for this, uh, Charles sets Moses up with a store of his own. Uh, He sets him up with some fruit to sell, places a mortgage on the wares. And he tells Moses, just make sure that you always buy your fruit from me (laughs) and pay your mortgage and we'll be honky-dory. And we're good. 
That's and, it. That's all that's required. It keeps it nice and simple. Uh, now, he had heard that Moses was buying some fruit from somewhere else. Okay. And he had stopped paying his mortgage. So Charles... So both things. Both things he was supposed to do, he <laughs> right. failed. It started to fail to do. Right. So Charles uh, obviously wants to find out what's going on. Right. Uh, as was indicated later in the court testimony, he brought one of his sons with him. Uh, the boy thought they were going to the fair. So it's to just confront a, Moses. To confront Moses. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, and yeah, the boy's... I would have, I think by that time, maybe 11 or 12 years old. Oh, wow. And we're going out to the fair with Dad. Oh, my gosh. So he goes down to the store to talk to, to Moses. Yeah. And Moses has a bit of a temper. Right. And did not take kindly to Charles asking these questions of him. Right. And in no uncertain terms, he pulled out a pistol and threatened him. He told him, if you do not leave my store, I'm going to start filling you full of holes. That's right. I read that. Oh, my and gosh. And Charles did not leave quick enough for him. Moses opened fire on, uh, on his brother-in-law. Uh, he sh first shot would have caught him in the left arm just above the elbow, in the left side just above the hip for the second shot. Oh, my God. Uh, Charles then turns to run out and flee the store. He is shot in the back and the right shoulder blade shattering his shoulder blade. Uh, he falls down on the boardwalk helpless and Moses, not satisfied still, shoots him again in the head. No way. And then he, uh, uh, th it's such a heinous crime, but he says he proceeds to snap his empty revolver at the body on the ground in anger until he's eventually tackled and arrested and locked up. He's clearly trying to murder is this person. He's very much so. He wants this man dead. How do you get the family <laughs> together for holiday meals after this? Yeah, it's quite an awkward Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's a little bit awkward. <laughs> yeah. So then the, the craziest thing about this is that Charles did not die. <laughs> He did not die. So, so how does this man survive all of these bullet wounds and one in the head? And what? And tell me, tell me about these wounds, especially the one in the head, because I know there's some crazy stories <laughs> about that. Yeah, the one in the head is, it's it's the most interesting part, I would say. Uh, he was so September seventeenth, eighteen eighty one. Uh, the Black Hills Daily Times ran an article. It was a nightly paper, so it was printed every night. And he was coherent enough to give an interview to the reporters at that time. So he's laying in his hospital bed talking to these guys, and he tells them, I have sustained no mortal wounds. Oh my gosh. These injuries will not get the better of me. Wow. But between the doctors and the reporters, I mean, surely this is the ravings of a lunatic mind. Right. There's no way a man could get shot so full of holes and survive. Right, not possible. And not possible. And the doctors describing the wound that evening said that we know that the ball or a portion of it has pierced the skull because with each pulsation of the heart, part of the brain would bubble through the wound. Oh, so, gross. <laughs> oh, that's so gross. Very clearly <laughs> indicated, yeah, that was definitely a headshot. Uh, wow. And so, oh my gosh, where there's a will, there's a way. This man survives. Yeah. So not only does he survive, but how long? Well, uh, he keeps going. He beats the doctor's estimates. They figured he'd be dead within a week and he just keeps ticking. Uh, they'd have to go in there and later on they said they had to remove fully a spoonful of brains from the wound oh, to help clean it out. Uh, but he just kept going, just kept ticking. And he lived to old age. <laughs> he, he did. Uh, when did he die eventually? And not of these wounds? And not of these wounds. No, this all happened in, in 1881 and he his recovery was slow. People would you know, see him on the streets and the newspaper right. would have a nice little blurb in there. Well, we saw Charles Posner around today. He's looking a little <laughs> bit pale, but he's getting around all right. Or Everyone's following his recovery. Everyone's following his recovery. This he, is amazing. He became quite, I think he was a well-liked man before, but certainly having this happened right. uh, made him a bigger local celebrity. Oh my gosh, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. So, okay, so tell, so... I mean, this is unbelievable. So I, I truly think that, you know, if anybody is listening and you have an injury that you think you can't recover from, <laughs> I mean, just channel Charles Posner. Yeah, come out to the Black <laughs> because, Hills. I mean, his brains were coming out of his head and he died of all age, or old age 37 years after these after wounds, the fact. right? 37 years. He lived for, th wow, that's, it's yeah. unbelievable. So I have to, I have to just read this because I thought this was amazing. So if, if everyone is to believe the crime, you know, if anyone watched the HBO Deadwood series and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and everybody knows just Deadwood at that time was a very crime filled place to be. So 
I found it interesting. I got. I have to just read these two quotes. The two different newspapers said this outrage is the most bloody we have been called upon to report in a long time. And then the next one said, without exception, it was the most brutal attempt at murder that ever took place in the hills. So I find that interesting, given the amount of crime that they are saying that this attempted murder <laughs> was the worst. That beat out the summer 1876. Well, when Wild Bill Hickok <laughs> was shot in the back of the head. I mean, he was murdered, so maybe yeah. <laughs> attempted murder versus murder, they're saying, you know. Yeah, I... The summer of 76, we saw quite a few killings. Yeah. Uh, a man by the name of Cardi was killed over in Gayville, being stabbed, just a few short weeks before Hickok was killed. Oh, my gosh. And then just a couple of weeks after that, you had Harry Young, who was the bartender present during Wild Bill's assassination, killed a man uh, he, he, in self-defense later on, but it was a case of mistaken identity as well. Oh, wow. Uh, and his case, uh, so Harry Young... He was being threatened by a man by the name of Laughing Sam Hartman. Okay. And Sam had this very distinct heavy coat that he would always wear. Yeah. Well, this he comes into the bar and he keeps threatening Harry, keeps threatening him. And uh, Carl Mann sends Harry into the back of the building so as to avoid confrontation. Right. Well, he, <laughs> Laughing Sam takes his coat off and leaves it on a bench out front. And this prankster comes by, puts on the coat. His name was Meyer Baum. And okay. he turns the cuff of the coat way up so he can't, you, you, he obscures his face and proceeds towards the back of the bar where he knows that Harry Young is waiting. Well, it's darker in the back of the building and all Harry sees is Laughing Sam's coat coming at him in a menacing fashion. So he pulls out his pistol and fires and he winds up killing Meyer Baum for this, what he later sees as an innocent prank. Right. And wow. Young was arrested and he was put on trial and he was found not guilty due to it being a case of self-defense. Oh my gosh. And wow. our very sassy newspaper man writes in the newspaper at the very conclusion of the article that the jury has returned the usual verdict of not guilty. So most people were found not guilty. Uh, well, McCall and he was. I, right, because uh, it took until tracking him down in a different state to get Jack McCall. Yeah, tried <laughs> and they guilty. finally got him. Right. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that you can shoot someone in the back of the head and not guilty because you claim that he what, shot your brother at one point or something. Mm -hmm. Was that the situation? Yeah, and this was outside the United States at the point. Right. Uh, so the United States law didn't apply. Amazing. And the jury, if they wanted to find him not guilty for a vengeance killing, then it was kind of an acceptable defense in the West. Kind of a lawless place. Yeah, <laughs> kind of a really lawless place, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's a, that's an, an unbelievable, that's an amazing story. And then, I mean, is there anything to share about Moses Dietenhofer? I mean, what was his fate in the end? Well, he got off pretty lucky, actually. He well, I'm was, not surprised after what we've just heard. <laughs> yeah, try to kill a man. He was put on trial and he was found guilty of, a, it's assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to kill, I think was the charge. Right. To which he was sentenced three years, which seems like a pretty light sentence, all things considered. That's ridiculous. That's uh, not even as many bullet holes as he put in Charles Poster. Right. So. You'd think he'd get at least one year for each hole. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, if I was he, on the uh, jury, that's what I would have done, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But Moses was very well connected. Remember, he came back from New York City. Right. And right. old Moses Dittenhofer, who he had a relative by the name of Boss Tweed. Okay. And anybody that's familiar with history will know Boss Tweed. Right. He was one of the most powerful and corrupt men in the history of New York City, I would say. Right, right. The most. <laughs> you can say what you will about modern day stuff. Right. I think Boss Tweed beats them all out. Wow. The guy would just delay projects so he'd get in millions and millions and millions of more dollars. Wow. A uh, heinous individual. And Boss Tweed leaned on Territorial Governor Ordway to have Moses pardoned after oh six gosh. months of his sentence. Uh, the people of Deadwood were rightly outraged at the thought that this man was going to get pardoned for his crimes. Right. Uh, they described Ordway as having... Uh, not even having the most basic human honesty for oh trying gosh. to do something like that. And he pardoned him anyways. Uh, apparently part of that pardoning deal was he had to leave the territory and never come back. Oh, interesting. But he still only served six months of a three-year sentence for trying to kill somebody. Okay. I just, I can't do any more with this story. This is unbelievable. <laughs> this is, I, can't, I 
can't handle it. Uh, okay, so on that note, we are going to, we're going to switch gears a little bit because we are actually sitting in Seth Bullock's cellar. We, we are in the Bullock Hotel. This place is um, notorious for being haunted uh, for a mm -hmm. number of reasons. Uh, you have actually had some personal experiences here in the cellar where we're sitting right now. So let's just jump right into that. Explain to me what what was what was happening in the cellar back in the 1800s and then how do we think that it's haunted and what have your experiences been all right well just for anybody listening if you can hear those footsteps it's not a ghost it's just somebody on the floor above us <laughs> i thought it was <laughs> it was a, a very well-timed uh, ghostly <laughs> sound effect for us uh, uh well like she's uh like mandy said we're down here in seth's cellar sitting next to where the bar is uh, I had helped out the hotel one night by giving a, uh, helping give one of the ghost tours. And during that time, I kind of teased Seth a little bit about losing the election as sheriff to John Manning. And uh, that, that was it. I, of course, I talked about all the good that Seth did in town, too, because right. he did do a lot to build up Deadwood. He built up Belle Fouche. I mean, tremendous friends with the future president, Theodore Roosevelt. Right. So he did a lot of good for Deadwood. But I did mention that one little jibe at his expense. Uh, so after the I guess tour, again, do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> uh, so we get done with the tour, and I'm talking with some of the gals at the front desk, and they had gotten a photograph in from uh, one of the guests that had stayed there. Yeah. And it's just a truly great photograph. There's a man standing facing the back bar mirror, and it appears that he's got this disembodied head floating above his shoulder. Wow. And I'm a skeptical believer. Right. I've had stuff happen to me, but you kind of have to think, well, so everybody's got something to gain. So you want right. to try to debunk or find out a reasonable explanation for right, everything. Of course. So I came back down by myself to try to debunk this photograph. So I'm stood maybe four or five feet away from the bar front and taking a couple of pictures. And I get this feeling that somebody had run right up behind me, mm -hmm. not touching me, but standing very uncomfortably close behind you. Right. And it got like 30 or 40 degrees cooler. Just this wow, intense, that's... huge cold all over my body. Right. And I'm standing facing the mirror, so I can very clearly see nobody came up behind me. There was nothing behind me. Wow. But it was just this super intense cold. Uh, my phone shut off. Like completely shut like off. Like completely like shut off. The phone after the just photo died. didn't go down, it died. Yeah, the phone died. Wow. And it just was a very <laughs> weird experience. And I went back upstairs and described what happened to the gals at the front desk and went to turn my phone back on and I had lost about 50% of my battery life and the photos that I was taking were all corrupted. Ooh, I have so. Seth was not happy with you. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> Seth... They said he wasn't happy, but it wasn't threatening. I didn't feel right. threatened. Right. It was just his way of saying, hey, you know, I heard you earlier, and I want you to know that I heard you. Right. So just, okay. Because Seth is not an Al Swearinger, and he was no. a decent guy, but, yeah, he wanted you to know. Yeah. So back off. <laughs> very, very <laughs> upstanding fellow, and I think he, he enjoyed a prank or two, and that was his uh, attempt at a prank on my expense. And it worked. That's Well, it clearly did. Now, so... So there's a couple other things that have happened here. So let's start with, uh, I think you mentioned earlier that this was, uh, was it an infirmary perhaps down here? At one I point had heard or? stories that okay. the cellar was at some point used to hold uh, quarantine bodies. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well. And people, you know, you're sick and you're dying of something. They kept them down here away from the population. And some people passed away. And I... Uh, as the story goes, people have some strange experiences down here, I and they imagine. attribute it to perhaps some of these people who had died. Right. Uh, you get some very strange feelings down here. I, I, uh, I Seth have them. among yes. them. <laughs> yes. From the second you walk down here, it's I mean it's very eerie. So, and then there are <laughs> there are actual there's actual footage on the gaming cameras, which you know, mm -hmm. which is something you don't mess with. You don't mess with gaming cameras. Yeah. Of course. So they captured. Uh, Inside the cashier's cage, there's the desk, the desktop that they work out of, and then there's several shelves below that that contain racks of coins or chips. Yeah. And there was a coin rack a couple of shelves below the top that you can see a coin shoot up out of the rack and then land on another shelf above it. And the shelves, I mean, they're very f they're flush, not one that sticks out further than the other. 
So that coin had to come up, out, and then back in and land on top of something. So clearly this ghost was ready to play some poker. Somebody was manipulating something, that's for sure, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> and this is on camera. And it was on camera, and it's a gaming commission camera. And like you said, you don't mess with those. You don't try to manipulate that footage at all because right. you're going to get yourself into some serious trouble if you mess with it. Wow, that's amazing. We'll have to check that out. But so <laughs> on that note, Ty, thank you yes. very much for all of these horrific <laughs> stories. <laughs> no, we uh, pr definitely appreciate your time. I think I can speak for a lot of people that ghost stories are extremely fascinating. I think everybody has, uh, you know, an experience Something, in their yeah. life at some point. And Deadwood is clearly full of them. You personally have had so many. So this was absolutely fascinating chatting with you. And uh, next we're going to talk to some paranormal experts mm -hmm. to get a little bit of insight into all of this and what's, what's really here to back up <laughs> everything you're saying, obviously. So, Ty, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it, as always. Well, thank you again for having me on, Mandy. And now, here's Mo Miller of Black Hills Paranormal Investigations. We are in the basement of the Bullock Hotel. We are in Seth's cellar. You've mm -hmm. been here for a few days. You are really an expert on paranormal in the Black Hills area. So I guess just to start us off, what are you finding here? We've heard a lot of really amazing stories coming out of this hotel and Deadwood in general. Right. Uh, so far, this time, we've been in here a few times over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we've downstairs here in the cellar, we've had a disembodied voice. Okay, explain disembodied Disembodied voice is really interesting. That's different than an EVP. An EVP okay. you catch only on audio, and then when you play it back, you'll hear it. It's okay. like that's at a frequency, I'd guess, like a dog whistle or something. So you wouldn't hear it in real life. Exactly. A okay. disembodied voice, just like you and I are speaking right now, and something behind us goes, hey, Mandy, or something. Oh, that's freaky. Yeah, it was really nice. And then we had some of our periscopes and different types of equipment out here last night, for instance, and it was all going off. So this was happening last night. Last night. You, so you had, so you and the group were down here mm -hmm. in the cellar, and you yes. just in the distance heard a voice very clearly speaking yeah. to you. Yeah, it was about twenty feet from you know from where we're sitting right now. Wow! And so did, and everyone knew immediately what it was, or did you think there was a person there? We thought it was a person because I actually got up and went to the stairwell where you go back upstairs to check and there was nobody there. Wow. Okay. So, wow. So many questions. So when you do something like this, do you ever, do you, do you know people who have died in the Bullock Hotel or whose spirits may be here or can you associate it with any one person? Once in a while you're able to associate captures with the location. Okay. Now we know there's been a few deaths here over the years, but you know, it's a hotel right? and people do die. Right. And for instance, the Adams house. Yeah. We know Mr. Adams died in the home. Oh, he did? Yes. Okay. He, he, he got sick outside the home. They brought him home and that's where he passed on. And so then you have done, obviously you've been doing this all over the Black Hills. So you've mm -hmm. been to the Adams house. And oh, sure. You have, you've picked up this. And so when I say, when I'm saying picking up signals, what do you guys say? Uh, it, we just call it capturing evidence. Capturing evidence. EV, okay. EVPs or sometimes you'll get video. Okay. Which is super, super nice if you, if you can. Right. But for instance, tying in with location at the Adams house, our very first time that we investigated there was like eight years ago. And it, there's a smoking room at the very top of the house. Okay. And that would be the turn of the century equivalent of a man cave, I guess. Okay. That's where yeah. the guys hung yeah. out. Anyway, when we didn't know about this, but we had some recorders up there. Yeah. And we captured a voice of a woman screaming fire. Fire. Interesting. Come to find out when we did the reveal for Deadwood History, there was a fire there. Wow. And so this was a disembodied voice again. No, that or, was an that EVP. That was an EVP. So you yes. caught it on the yes, audio. Yes, we did. Okay. So interesting. Right. So a lot of times you'll just have audio recordings running and then you'll listen to them the following day and then you'll catch these things. Exactly. And what a lot of people don't realize, like for instance, myself, I have four recorders. Okay. And let's say we investigate a place for six hours. Okay. And I've got them scattered about the location. Right. That's 24 hours of audio that I'm going to have to go over in real time. Oh and the gosh. stuff you see on the TV, you're only seeing the highlight reel. You're not seeing all the behind the scenes, the work that has to go into it. And so then when you hear something, so you hear this voice on the mm -hmm. recording then at that point, then what's the next step in your world? What do you do? Uh, normally what we try to do, if it's, a, if it's a storied location, say like the Bullock Hotel, the Adams, there's tons of information or even the brothels across the street. You know, there's tons of information on them. If right. we're doing a private residence, what we'll try to do is go to like the Register of Deeds and find out who previous owners were. Maybe what was on the location before the place that, you know, it might be a house, let's say. Right. But 100 years ago, it was a hardware store. Right. Okay. So okay. we have to, we kind of, it's, you have to separate with the things that you're capturing, capturing 
you know, is it from, you know, recent times or is it from 100 years ago? It's like peeling back the layers of an onion. That's so interesting. Okay. So, so in, as, I believe as you were saying, I mean, the, the Old West in Deadwood was not that long ago. No, so it wasn't. we're talking about ghosts that are here from obviously a very long time ago to 100 years ago. Exactly. And most of the things I think we pick up here when we're in Deadwood have, have to do with the town. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because so. there was there was Native Americans out here, of course, but you know this was a sacred land. They didn't live in like Deadwood Gulch, for instance. Right. Right. So most of the stuff we do pick up, I'm thinking it, it's the local things from since de since the inception of Deadwood itself. Now, so what do you think is the most interesting thing about the Bullock Hotel, since you've been here investigating? Well, the neat thing is the history for one. Yeah. And it, you know it's documented. Right. Also, the neat thing is it hasn't changed a lot. Right. Over the years. So the neat thing when people come here and you're going upstairs and seeing the hotel rooms and things like this, like if you look at the walls and the doors here, right. these doors were somewhere. actually part of the hotel upstairs at one time. Oh, wow. Right. So does that also help spirits, I guess, stay in the area if things have not been messed with, for lack of a better term? I, you know, I think so. It, yeah. That's one of the things that we were still trying to figure out because sometimes yeah. it seems as though things have an attachment. Uh, got it. Right. Okay, it might be sense. attached to, say, this bar we're sitting at, or it got might it. be attached to a certain chair. Got it. Or it could just be the location in and of itself. So this bar, so this was, this was very different in a hundred years ago. Right. This is a little bit different than it was, but it's still a very eerie feeling down here. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. So and we're, we were talking about EVPs. Our yes. very first time investigating here, I was up on the third floor. Yeah. This is just a regular EVP audio recorder. It was February two in the morning. You know, it's minus eight, you know, it's colder than you know what. Right. Anyway, and we get an EVP and it's not a voice. It's a saw, <gasps> like a hand saw. Zoom, 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 zoom. Oh my and, gosh. But we know before the hotel was here, Saul Starr and Seth Bullock had a hardware store right. here. So is that residual from when it was a hardware store? Is that a residual versus an intelligent, which is something that interacts with you? Oh my gosh. That's crazy. It's really interesting. So the things that you must see and hear, I'm just freaked out by the footsteps that keep going I, I know, above right? us. But, but I, I can only imagine the things in the dark of night that you see and hear. I, well, you know, the funny thing is, especially with our team, there's, we're not really scared. There's nothing here that's going to hurt you. Right. Now, might it startle you? Absolutely. But it's not going to hurt you. No. Most ghosts are not out to hurt no. you. Okay, I'm going to end with that. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's good news. <laughs> thank you so much, Mo. Well, thank I you really, so much really for having me. I really appreciate everything that you're doing and sitting down with us. This is, this is very, very cool. Well, to thank hear, you. Hear it from the source. Let's wrap up with Chris Carpenter, who's with Open Range Events in Michigan and Scattered Souls Paranormal. Let's dig right in. So we're here in Seth Bullock's cellar. We're right. at the Bullock Hotel. What brought you from Michigan to the Bullock Hotel? What fascinated you about this? Obviously, so it's a notorious Old West town. Right. But. Well, we were coming home from a trip from the um, Stanley Hotel, Estes okay. Park. So we invent, uh, investigated that with um, actually another event group. And um, we were on our way home. We drive everywhere we go. So okay. there's just so much to see and, you know, right. check out along the way. So we stopped here in Deadwood three years ago and we stayed here in the Bullock Hotel well, and you stayed here. we okay. did in um, room 207 which is really amazing we had um, EVPs a lot of EVPs we had two gentlemen talking we had a dog barking um, all night a big dog like right outside our bedroom window oh my gosh and, and so we're on the second floor too so it was like right outside the window just barking and clearly barking. a dog's not floating in thin air right so obviously, um, yeah. babies <laughs> crying babies that just cried 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 um, we had a woman that was singing and humming Wow. Um, right and um, so these were all caught on your audio right so in what we just learned is EVP is caught on audio and disembodied voices when you hear them clearly in real right, life. Right. So you li you listen to the audio that was running through the evening and you caught all of this right. while you were sleeping. Yes. That's yes. A little bit scary. So <laughs> I, it was pretty. It was pretty crazy when we uh, did the playback. Okay, 207 I mean, is one of the most haunted rooms. Um, 307 here is um, pretty haunted. I think 314, and there's another one 211, I believe. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm going to write those down and not stay in any of them. Yeah, I, right. I, I will stay in this hotel, but I will not stay in any of mm -hmm. those rooms. So thank you for sharing. Um, I know a lot of people probably will want to stay in those rooms. Definitely. Not me. Definitely. Definitely. Not me. So when you say that those are haunted, you, uh, you previously there have been other paranormal groups that have been able to prove that or people right. have said or they've heard a number of things in these rooms. Or regular hotel guests. Okay. Yes. So and upstairs at the checkout um, counter upstairs, there is a little, um, there's like three different books with with um, guests, you know, witnessed right. accounts that they have written down. So there's a lot of coinciding stories that, you know, everybody's and probably caught. things being moved in right. weird places. Right. I've heard that a couple times People as well. sitting on the beds, um, um, impressions, you can clearly see where people were sitting that oh, wow. really weren't there. So oh, wow. it's, there's, there's a lot of weird activity here. Well, I'm sure we could talk for hours about right, this. And I've right. got so many more questions of places all over the country right. I want to ask you and about. And there's so many more too that we've been to. So Exactly. Right. So we'll have to pick this up again. So yes. thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much for having really me. Really fun to be here in the Bullock Hotel yes. among all these great people and all of the spirits that are with us right now. Right, so, right. And for you you guys all to prove it is pretty amazing. Yeah, so. well, thank you so much. 